One other uh, update to uh, that search process. Just want to let you couple, know a couple of things in response to some of the feedback we heard in the meeting and the people who came to us outside of the meeting. We really appreciate that. Uh, well, one, we did make some uh, minor tweaks to those job descriptions. Uh, some of them just for kind of clarity to make it more specific in some areas. And we did update the job uh, description to make it the family and children's ministry director. Uh, the youth ministry director for now is did remain a part-time uh, position, uh, the way the church council voted to it, although leadership both at the elder and church council uh, level is open to God's leading in the future uh, in that area. Uh, and that uh, we will be introducing those search committees to you over the next couple weeks. I know we talked about staggered start and the order of which would begin first. It turns out uh, the first group that is able to find a night to meet together, they will be the ones that start first. So the race is on. Uh, for, the search for the search committees. And listen, if you have more comments, questions, we hope you will still bring those to me or, or Pastor Jaden or to any of our elders. We want to hear from you and continue want to hear from you as this process moves forward. Well, speaking of family and children, today is the fifth Sunday of the month, which means it's kind of a, a family service. Our elementary age school kids are here in the service with us and not in a children's church down the hall. And so I kind of wanted to start our message this morning uh, a little bit from their point of view and ask for you to imagine, you students that are here this morning who normally, about a situation, a, uh, a let's pretend for a moment and imagine something that might happen to you and how your parents might want you to respond. And grown-ups, you could play along too if you want. So let's say... Someone would mean to you. Maybe it was on the playground, maybe it was something at sports, maybe it was at school, maybe it was a brother or sister. How would your parents want you to respond if someone was mean to you in the way they should not have been? Would your parents want you to be mean right back? Nah, I'm getting, I'm getting some no's. Right, right. Would they want you to punch them in the nose? No, definitely not. Definitely not. I heard some parents say, like, no. Uh, I think it was actually grandparents that were saying no there. Uh, what, right, what they tell you to do, they say, hey, you, you need to either walk away or if, so, if someone's doing something wrong, go tell a parent or, or just return what they're saying with kindness and, and, and be done with it. And parents, uh, grandparents, anyone who's been around kids, we know this is the advice we give. To not be mean back to the person who's mean to you. To treat others the way you would want to be treated. And yet... Boy, it gets a lot more complicated, at least it seems to, as we get older. Think of the culture we live in right now, which is a culture that is all about attack, about clapping back, about people. It's not just online anymore. It's kind of leaked its way into people's lives. Uh, big disagreements are not settled with conversations, but with attacks back and forth. You go to any news site you want today, any mainstream news site, and be like, this celebrity said this. <gasps> And then this celebrity said this back. <gasps> and I'm like, who cares? That is, what is that? How is that the news? But that's what we're being trained to do. And if we're not careful, we fall into that same mistake. Because it's difficult when we're being attacked. When what we believe and stand for is being attacked. It's hard when someone is mean to us. We want to we wanna go on the offensive and yet, that's not the advice we give our kids. Or what about when we're attacked for our faith? What does it look like to stand firm and to still follow the advice we give our kids? So that's what we're going to talk about today. How we are to respond when we are attacked or our faith is attacked. How to respond when we are attacked or our faith is attacked. And we're going to see that in Mark chapter 14. You could open up there. And we're going to read through the passage this morning. And then we're going to see uh, the way Peter deals with that situation. We're going to then see the example of Jesus and how he responds. And then that will be our guide to talk practically how we might respond when we are attacked or our faith is attacked. I'm going to start reading in Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 53. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. 
and he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Well, if you weren't here last week, you're like, wait, what's going on? So let's just rewind a little bit, say what's going on. Uh, Jesus has been in, in Jerusalem for the last couple chapters. He's already been done with his ministry, or kind of wrapping up his normal ministry here on earth, because he's about to go to the cross, be raised from the dead, do a 40-day Bible study, and then ascend to heaven. And on his way to Jerusalem, he warned his disciples three times, when I go to Jerusalem this last time, I am going to die, and I will be resurrected. And last week, we saw that this process of Jesus' march to the cross is in full swing. He told his disciples that he would betray, be betrayed. His disciples said to him, we will never leave you. And Jesus says, you will fall away from me when trouble comes. Uh, Jesus goes through this, this evening of, of, of anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane because he knows what is coming with the cross and the brutality that he awaits him. And yet he says to God, not my will, but your will be done. We talked about living a life of prayerful dependence last week, if you were here for that. And then Jesus is betrayed. He is arrested, even though he did nothing wrong. And it says, they all left him and fled in verse 50. And so now Jesus is going to go before this court called the Sanhedrin, which is, is there's another way of saying it, which is the uh, high priest and or the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. The Sanhedrin was a high court. Some people like to call it the Supreme Court, but it was kind of like a pretend Supreme Court because Rome was occupying and ruling over Judea and Jerusalem at that time. So really, they let them kind of handle kind of some minor grievances. Uh, they could let them decide some little things, kind of give them feeling like they had some control over each other, but there were no real major decisions that this court was able to to uh, make on their own. And that is kind of one of the reasons we'll talk about next week why they don't condemn Jesus to death. They need to go to Pontius Pilate to make that happen. And so Jesus is going to face this, this trial now. And we, even though all the disciples fled, we, we hear Peter is following behind. And I think this is very brave of Peter. I think of because what happens later in this passage, people want to jump on Peter right away for kind of hanging back and being in the courtyard. But while everyone else fled, Jesus, uh, Peter ended up kind of coming back, following Jesus, to see what would happen is there close by. And we'll get to him in just a minute. But first, we open up with what happens with Jesus in this trial, which we will see is just a total sham. Let me read a little bit. 55. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. That's a twisting of Jesus' word. He did say the temple was going to come down. He did say there's not going to be one stone left. He didn't say he was going to do it. He was prophesying about the future, so they're twisting his words. Uh, but... Look what it says in verse 59. Yet even this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? And it's pretty clear this trial is not a fair trial, is it? First of all, I want to draw your attention to the fact this trial has happened in the middle of the night. If you get called to like someone's house in the middle of the night, and there's a bunch of like judges and leaders and kind of witnesses there, it doesn't seem like a real legit trial to me. Not only that, but they're kind of violating the Jewish law here and the way they're supposed to go about these trials. We know a little bit about how these things were normally done with the Sanhedrin at the time of Jesus, thanks to the Mishnah. We don't know everything, but usually you're supposed to open with the person's defense. I don't see any defense of Jesus here. You're also supposed to have witnesses bring testimony more than one witness, if you're trying to put someone to death, and they're supposed to be the ones who are the reason for the trial, not having a trial and then be like, hey, anyone see him say this? Hey, can, can we find any witnesses? Right? This is, not a real, this is not a real trial. Jesus has done nothing wrong. They are looking to get rid of him. And it's interesting at some point that when the chief priest kind of stands up and says, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? And then Jesus says this in verse 61. But he remained silent and made no answer. If you've been following along with us in the book of Mark, this is surprising. 
Because throughout all the book of Mark, these religious leaders, whether it be the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, whoever it is, they would come to Jesus trying to trap him or trick him. It literally says that in the text. And they came to him trying to catch him in a trap. And every time they ask Jesus some question that seems like it's a really difficult question to ask, and Jesus answers it perfectly and gets away, scot-free, no problem. He figured it out. He's God wrapped in human flesh. This is not hard for him to figure out. And yet here he says nothing. No defense against false accusations. I think Jesus makes no defense for himself here for three reasons. One, to fulfill the scriptures. Isaiah 53 verse 7 says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. And he stays silent to fulfill the scriptures about him. The second reason why he makes no defense of himself is he is willingly giving up his life. His path is to the cross. Now, did it need to be done with the brutality and the evil that we are going to see occur in this chapter and in the next one? No, but he would be going to the cross and made no defense because he understood that when he died, his death would be used to justify us. That all who believe in Jesus and his death on the cross and resurrection from the dead would have their sins forgiven and the hope of eternal life. And so he makes no defense because he knows he is going to be used as the sacrifice, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And this is just a personal observation, number three. I wonder if Jesus made no defense because we... Have no defense. We have no defense before God for our sin. When we do something wrong, we do something opposed to God's will, when we reject our Creator, there is no defense for that except the blood of Jesus. And so already He is acting as our substitute, making no defense as He heads. To the cross. Well, the conversation doesn't stop there. The chief priest asks another question in verse, uh, halfway through verse 61. It says, Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witness do you need? You heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. All right, Jesus' response here is loaded. The chief priest asks him, are you the son of the blessed? Which right there is a loaded question. No one, we're very comfortable today calling ourselves children of God. But then to call yourself a son of God was to make yourself equal to God. And and so the question is loaded, and Jesus says, I am, which is a loaded phrase. If you don't know the, the Bible very well, that's a loaded phrase. That's how God describes himself. He is the I am. That's a name he gives for himself. And so it had been clear to everyone there that Jesus is saying, I am not only the Son of the Blessed One, but I am God himself, which Jesus is. He is God wrapped in human flesh because we believe in one God expressed in three persons, the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. How dare he? Only God himself has power. And in, if you read the ESV like I do, you see power is capitalized as, a, as almost a, a name of God. How could someone sit at the right hand only if they were God? And Jesus will ascend to heaven and sit at the right hand of the Father. And all authority on heaven and on earth will be given to him. And he says, then coming with the clouds of heaven, which we know the New Testament and lots of references to that, The New Testament hasn't been written yet, so we we can't go there. Uh, But there's lots of references to that in the Old Testament, often the clouds being the vehicle in which God moved. 
We see an example such as the way he led the Israelites through the desert in their wanderings in the wilderness. When he appeared as a, cloud, a, a, a pillar of, of cloud or smoke during the day and fire at night, there's all sorts of references I could spend the rest of today actually going through them uh, where that is. So Jesus is being very clear here. He's saying, yes, I am God. Yes, I am the son of the blessed one. And so they lose it. They're like, see blasphemy? Look, he is deserving death. Now notice, again, as I said earlier, they can't really condemn him for death. And we'll talk about maybe more why uh, next week if we have, have time. But of deserving death. And so they're going to move him to the trial phase because they, they think he's full of blasphemy because they do not believe his words. They do not believe he's the Messiah. They do not believe he's the Son of God. And so in verse 65, and some began to spit on him, to cover his face. You want to think of almost like blindfolding him, covering his face. Spit on him, uh, covering his face, and strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. And the picture here is they, they blindfolded him in some respect or covered his face so he couldn't see. And then they hit him and be like, who hit you? Prophesy. If you're the son of the blessed one. If you are the I am. Who hit you? Cruelty. And side note, how patient is God with us? How patient is he with all our sin? How patient is Jesus being on his way to the cross to be abused as such? I don't think that's the main thrust of this passage. We'll probably talk about more about that in the next day or two. To be treated so poorly by the ones he came to save. How patient is God with us in our sin? And he still gives us an opportunity to know him. That one stuck with me this week. Well, the, the kind of camera angle shifts from Jesus to Peter at this point. Because uh, Jesus is going to go and be tried again elsewhere. And it comes back to Peter's point of view. And it says in verse 66, And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither, nor, uh, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. Okay, this is a reference to what we talked about last week. Remember I told you how Jesus was betrayed and all his disciples said, hey, we're never going to leave you, especially Peter. Uh, and Jesus like, you all will fall away from me. Uh, it also said this way back in verse uh, 29, even though they all fall away, says Peter, I will not. In verse 30, and Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And that night, Peter had fallen asleep three times already when Jesus had asked him to stay awake. And now in this chapter, as Jesus said his trial, Peter is denying Jesus just like Jesus said he would. He doesn't know if Jesus is going to be put to death. Peter's afraid. This is terrifying. He doesn't know what's going to happen. And if, if Jesus goes to, to his death and, and is executed in some way, what will happen to Peter? Let me continue reading. In verse 69, And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear. Yikes. That's about as strong as you get in ancient Jewish culture. To be like, no, 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 I, I swear on, I don't know, what would we swear on besides the Bible? I don't know, I can't even, I, yeah, I don't want to say any of them because they're all bad. Uh, but I invoke a curse on himself and swear, I do not know this man of who you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. And we see in Peter's failure and in Jesus' trial as he willingly goes to cross a kind of compare and contrast of two ways of responding to the trial that they are facing. Let's start with Peter. 
and we're going to be able to begin answering our question, how do we act when we are attacked or our faith is attacked? Peter follows the way of self-defense. Peter follows the way of self-defense. He denies Jesus. It's, it's obvious the text doesn't explicitly say it, but I, I think we're all on the same page here. Uh, that he's afraid. He doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He's arrested. He's captured by the authorities. Uh, they, they've known for a while that someone has wanted to kill Jesus. And Jesus had warned them three times when he went to Jerusalem, he would die. And so Peter, in that moment, is thinking only about himself and his self-defense. He's thinking about his reputation. Does he want to be associated with Jesus, who I think he believes is going to die, even though he did nothing wrong? Peter wants to defend his life and his body, what if he is either arrested or killed along with Jesus if he identifies with Jesus and so he denies him. And so rather than following Jesus, it's, it's all about Peter. It's all about his self-defense. It's all about his defensiveness and worried about the consequences of following Christ. And it's something that I think we are all tempted to and I think r- relates uh, to a lot of the ways we face trial and when we are under attack in the world today in one way or another. I already mentioned <laughs> our relationship with social media or rig- really any media and this, this culture of attack that we are in. What does that ultimately accomplish? Like, why are people always striking back besides the fact that it sells as entertainment? Well, when someone attacks us and we want to strike back, we're trying to defend ourselves. We're not thinking about the bigger picture the way Jesus does in his trial. We're thinking about just ourselves and where we are and how we feel. That person may be mad. I need to tell him how mad he made me. That person was wrong. He needs to know how wrong he was. He doesn't even know how wrong I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him how wrong he is. I don't think a lot of us do that um, necessarily. But I have seen more of this attitude among Americans leak offline and into our lives and the way we deal with relationships as well. We're in danger of of focusing just on ourselves and forgetting that we're supposed to represent Christ. Forget that in our conversation something better could happen. Do you think when people are fighting back and forth, any progress is being made on the issue? No, it's all about making themselves feel better. Ah, I got them with a good jab. Woo, I owned them. No one's changing anyone's mind in that situation. There's not an honest conversation happening. It's all about self-defense. It's all about, you know, whoever's doing the attacking. It's not about something else. Peter kind of acts this way earlier. When the soldiers come, even though Jesus said, listen, I'm going to be arrested, Peter goes and cuts off one of the soldiers' ears with a sword. He just lashes out, and Jesus has to calm him down. But there's another way we practice self-defense. Sometimes we go maybe not so direct, Maybe sometimes we take that kind of more passive-aggressive route, right? We're not going to say anything to them, but we're going to let them know we're not happy. You know what I'm talking about? I have have someone I knew uh, sometime, not super early in their marriage, sometime in the first 10 years, something had happened. I don't even remember the circumstances. And uh, his wife uh, was upset, and she decided to kind of bang around the kitchen a little bit, right? All the cupboards closed, like, just a little too hard, like, not violent, but just like, that's not the way you close the cupboard normally. Or just, just, <sighs> you know that? Have you ever done that? I've done it. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want them to know there's something wrong. Even if we don't go on the offensive, we're going to let them know, right? And, and uh, my friend, uh, I'll just finish his story. Uh, uh, he said, uh, he ended up saying, like, hey, you're kind of being like your mom right now. I'm here to report to you today, my friend is still alive. <laughs> and actually, I would not suggest anyone take that route, but it actually worked. She was like, oh man, I, I am, I'm doing that thing. I'm doing that thing. I'm just thinking about myself. I'm not thinking about us and our marriage and the bigger picture, what's happening here. We need to talk and work this out. Way of the self-defense is not the way of the gospel. It's not the way of healing and reconciliation. It's all about self and protecting oneself and making oneself feel better, which is contrasted with how Jesus acts. How does he act? Well, Jesus is the way of self-denial. He denies himself for something greater than himself. 
he does not protect his reputation. He does not protect his body. He does not even attempt to protect the reputation of Almighty God when all this false witness is brought before him except to say that he is the I Am. Jesus walks the way of self-denial so he could serve something bigger, to be the lamb that is slain, to be, to be our substitute on the cross. And the way of self-denial is always better because we get to see then the bigger picture of what God might be doing in our situation. This way of self-denial, it's talked all over in Scripture when it comes to conflict or, 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 or being attacked, either for our faith or anything in our life. Uh, earlier in Mark, Jesus told him to take up your cross. Take up your cross with him and follow him. Proverbs 25, if you want to go Old Testament about this idea, Proverbs 25 says this, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. That in kindness, they will see the error of their ways. In, ki- in being kind and generous, even to your enemy, you will shock them. Because that is not what they are expecting. Romans 12 quotes this passage and then adds this on the end. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That is the way of self-denial. I know uh, I've seen how this works in workplaces, too. Um, back before I was in, in church work, which obviously there's no conflict in any of the church work I've been involved in the last 10 years. Uh, before that, in, in the workplace, and, and there were just some tense relationships going on. And, and, and usually it, it wasn't the, the kind of head-on, although I have been in newsrooms where there was yelling back and forth, and I'm like hiding in my desk like, I'm just trying to get my work done. Stop yelling at each other. But a lot of times it's the God, did you hear what blah, blah, blah said about blah, blah? Oh, I heard what blah, blah said. You know that they blah, blah. Oh, I, so I know they blah, right? Right? Uh, but the people who go and confront the problem, instead of like building themselves up and getting all worked up and practicing that self-defense of gossip or attack, they end up solving the problem. Now, sometimes those people still did not like each other, but they weren't yelling at each other. They weren't gossiping. It was out in the open. They were working for something larger than their own defense. They were working towards repairing a relationship, even if it never got all the way repaired. And so then that leaves us to make a choice, the choice of self-defense or self-denial. And this is what we should think about this morning. And, and uh Actually, gonna don't put up this last slide. I, I changed this point. I'm like, this is not right this morning. I have better wording. So I'll tell you. Uh, follow the way of self-denial by seeing the trials in your life as a chance to represent Jesus. Follow the way of self-denial by seeing the trials in your life as a chance to represent Jesus. I'll, I'll do this briefly, but I want to address it in two ways. One, the being attacked for our faith, and one, just that normal interpersonal conflict kind of attack. In the first, when we're being attacked for our faith, I know sometimes the, it's hard when the core of what you believe in is being attacked. And that, that, that pull and that temptation to attack back is so strong, or try to have that perfect answer, is, is, is so strong. But I don't think that's necessarily the time for apologetics. It certainly isn't the time for being rude. Because I think when someone is meanly or cruelly or confrontationally attacking your faith, they're not really looking for answers. And that might be the time for a, a kind word, a calm word, a loving response, a respect that isn't deserved. Because in that moment, you're representing Jesus. You're practicing 
self-denial rather than self-defense. And if they have real questions, they'll come to you. And that's where apologetics and understanding our faith and all that really comes into play. But don't worry. If someone is coming after you for your faith and you don't have the answer, that's normal. I remember, and I've told this story before, way back, I was a new believer, super excited. I wanted to tell my friend about Jesus, and so I tried to worm my newfound faith, in, or worm? Uh, get my newfound faith into our, our conversation. We're chatting on the phone, and I'm like, yes, yeah, so I'm going to church now, and you know, blah, blah, blah. And my friend goes, oh, so you hate women now? And I was like, oh, what? Where did, the, where did that come from? Like, I'm just, yikes. And he was, he was ready to go. And the problem is my friend knew the Bible. So he started quoting the Bible to me. He knew the Bible better than I did because he's brilliant. And I, you know, was just this new, new believer. And he had just studied it, uh, like, in, in, a secular, in a secular sense. And I had no response to him. And I felt terrible. I, had no, I didn't even know the passages he was quoting. And... Yet, when he was baptized, uh, six, eight months later, uh, he said, hey, thank you, and, and for my wife, Cheryl, for being like an example of what it looks like to be a Christian. We were like, what? I thought we totally failed in representing the faith. But we just responded kindly to those attacks. And then when he had questions, he asked them. That's the way of self-denial, the way Jesus does. Didn't protect himself, but instead looked to that larger goal of showing the love of Jesus to those around us. So we might have the opportunity to share what our hope is really all about. And then last, in our everyday life, how do we practice this self-denial? It's really the same, it's really the same thing. And I'm about out of time here, so let me just mention this quickly. Sometimes we have to return evil for good and just show them the love of Jesus because we're supposed to be representing Jesus here on earth. We're supposed to be showing people the love of Christ. We're not going to change anyone's mind about what they think about us or anything, usually in those, those moments and those exchanges of casual cruelty. But we have an opportunity, by not returning that cruelty, by being a little bit more like Jesus, by maybe surprising them, Maybe even repairing the relationship, which is what Jesus coming to earth and dying was all about. So let me encourage you this morning. Follow the way of self-denial by seeing the trials in your life as a chance to represent Jesus. When we follow that way of self-denial rather than self-defense. We will find opportunities to be like Jesus in those moments to share the gospel, maybe not in words, but in actions, and have some hope of repair and reconciliation. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the great patience you have shown us in our rebellion, in our sin, in our mistakes, in sending Jesus for us, giving us an opportunity for forgiveness. We trust in you. And Lord, I pray for those in this room who may not know you and may not trust in Jesus, I pray that, that they would get their questions answered, that you would draw them to someone who can help lead them through that process to understand what Jesus did for them on the cross and through his resurrection, that through his self-denial that we read about today, they would just see the love that you have for us, now you sought after us, even when we rejected you, even in the midst of our sin. Lord, I pray that we would be a people that would become more like Jesus in the way we respond to others, in the way we respond to the culture war, in the way, in the way that we respond uh, to people attacking our faith, the way we respond just in our interpersonal conflict, that we would find that way to self-denial, to, to see the bigger picture of restoring a relationship rather than kind of closing in on self-defense and work on our hearts, Lord, to do this. Show us what it looks like even this week to return a loving word for a casually cruel one. Show us what it looks like to return good for evil. Show us what it looks like to be like the Son. We pray this by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with me as we close with singing hymn number 493, It Is Well With My Soul, hymn number 493. <laughs>
that song, my sin, not in part, but the whole. Now go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Honor all men. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Have a great week of worship. Thank you.